Hi, everyone. This is Rob Gray from ASU and the Perception Action Podcast again, and this is another one of my video article reviews. So in this article review, I want to focus on some research on scaling equipment. So imagine that you are a coach working with a relatively novice performer and they're really struggling, right? You, when you try to get them to do the full skill, they're being very inaccurate. They can't perform well at all. How do you adjust the task difficulty to make it better for them to learn, right? To create a better environment, to challenge them at the op optimal level. Well, we can distinguish kind of two very different ways to do this. Um, one of the ways that's very commonly used in kind of an information processing approach is task decomposition, right? Because it's believed that, you know, that you can break things apart. One thing we might do is, you know, in baseball, we have you hit off a tee instead of hitting a pitch. In tennis, instead of having you try to make a forehand on a real shot hit at you, you can do a soft toss, right? The coach can throw at the ball at you very slowly. This is commonly also called part training, right? So because you're breaking the skill into parts. In the, in the T example, you're separating the information from the movement, right? You're swinging without needing to pick up the information about the ball flight. In the soft toss, you're changing the information. Sometimes we, we only break we break the um, scale of movement apart. Like in golf, sometimes we'll people will have people do a half swing, right? All those are examples of task decomposition. In the ecological approach are the preferred method, the way of doing it is task simplification, right? So in task simplification, what we're gonna do is keep the skill all together, but scale everything down to make it less difficult for a performer, right? We're gonna we wanna make sure we have the information and movement coupled, want to make sure we have the whole movement always there, but we're just going to make it easier for the performer. And one of the ways that this has been shown, and one of the most common examples of this is uh, using scaling equipment, you know, so changing the size and mass and weight distribution of equipment for, especially for children. And this is a st this has been studied in, there's in quite a bit, right? There's a fair amount of work on it. But one of the most recent studies that we actually covered in the very first journal club, if you look uh, through the videos here, you'll find that video, is uh, scaling equipment in tennis. So in tennis, what you can do to make a task uh, less difficult for a, a, a child is to give them a smaller racket, right? So a racket that's not as long and have lower compression balls, right? So uh, so that they don't bounce as high, right? So they can, and this study, um, which we wrote in the first uh, journal club by Tim Buzzard and colleagues from a AIS, um, looked at uh, how scaling equipment affects the variability in the string. And it had some really nice findings. As I said, we reviewed it in detail in that journal club, in that video, if you want. But some of the things they found were, what they were showing here, what's shown here is the, the relationship between the angle of the upper arm and the forearm in the swing. And what they found was, when you give kids in the group that had the scaled racket and the lower compression balls, you get nice coupling right between the uh, the uh, these these joints, right? Those shown by the points in red, right? So they're strongly correlated. This suggests they're working together in a synergy. Okay. Whereas for the scaled equipment, when you give um, when you give full size equipment to to kids, the blue line, you can see they're really not varying their forearm at all, right? It's all upper arm movement. So really, this is an example of freezing degrees of freedom, right? So because they're keeping one joint basically not changing, right? So to perform the task, right? And I've, as I've said in, in some of the other videos I've done, if you want to go back and look at them, um, freezing degrees of freedom is a much less uh, advanced solution, right? It gets it done, but a synergy is going to always, almost always result in better performance overall, right? It's a more a sophisticated advanced solution for for the degrees of freedom problem than freezing. Freezing is something you want to do maybe initially, but get over really quickly, right? So we're seeing a better solution there. They also, another way to show this, this is a, a kind of a state space of the possible forearm angles and upper arm, arm angles you can use in, in making a tennis uh, stroke. Um, for the full size, you see the blue, okay? Um, it, and the the uh, scaled racket you're seeing the red, right? So I, I know this is kind of a very simplified interpretation of this, but I always think this, for me, this shows that the, when you give a kid a scale racket, they're just using more of the available space, right? They're, they're taking advantage of, of uh, the opportunity to use the degrees of freedom more effectively. Whereas with the full size racket, they're 
you know, constricting it to a very narrow range of state space. Okay, so in this original study, they got these nice findings, you know, building on earlier work that shows you perform and learn better with a scaled racket, they're kind of understanding why in this study, this kind of evidence of functional variability, you get better synergies between joint angles when you give a kid a scaled racket, when you use this task simplification. So the study I want to talk about today came out late last year is building on this previous work, the same group, Tim and his colleagues, and um, nicely kind of looks at, again, more about why we get these effects, okay? And uh, so it's a, it's a really nice extension of this. And what they were mainly interested in, right? And so in this uh, today, I'm gonna emphasize a few key terms here um, that we sometimes talk about in motor learning, essential variables, elemental variables, and performance variables, right? So an essential variable is the, the, as it says below, is an invariant feature of the motor system that, um, that we seem to control, right? So it's, I sometimes refer it as an outcome variable, right? So in the baseball examples I was talking about in the early other videos I've done, the hand position at release for me is an is a, is essential variable, right? It's a variable that you're trying to control in your movement, right? It's not a performance variable, right? The goal of pitching is not to get your hand to some position, right? Um, a performance variable is the speed or the accuracy, right? So essential variables that essentially it's the, the movement outcome you're trying to produce for me. Um, so in tennis, what, what they are trying to look at is it seemed like for the, from the earlier studies, the outcome that the person is trying to produce consistently in the tennis stroke is the distance between the shoulder and the racket at impact. impact. You want that to be very consistent and have a certain distance, right? There seems to be this, that's why the title, the sweet spot. There seems to be a sweet spot distance for the best tennis stroke, this, this essential variable of the shoulder racket distance. So they wanted to see how does this essential variable shoulder racket distance relate to performance, the accuracy of the, the tennis shot. Essential variables, so the outcome of your movement, right, and Bernstein's a classic idea, can be created by different configurations of the elementary variables, which are your joint angles, right? So in pitching, my hand position, the same hand position can produ be produced by different shoulder, elbow, wrist angles. In tennis, the same shoulder racket distance at impact could be produced by different angles of my body, right? That's the degrees of freedom problem. That's what, right there. So what they wanted to do in this study, so in the, the other study they looked at, the, essentially the essential elemental, these are called elemental variables, the joint angles that contribute to the essential variable. In the other study, they wanted, they mainly looked at the elemental vari variables of the, the upper arm and forearm in here, they wanted to actually add the hand and they included the racket, hand racket segment in that. Okay, so that's kind of the two things, that, the extensions they were making with this study. In terms of methods, they used the same participants that were in the previous study, but they didn't use the same data set, right? They collected, the, it was from a different uh, data collection period. In the, in the study, there was 21 children, 14 boys, seven girls, their mean age was eight. They were randomly sp split into two groups. One group used a standard tennis racket, which is 27 inches and a standard compression tennis ball. The other group had the task simplified by using uh, a shorter racket, 21 inches, and a ball that was 25% compression of a regular ball, okay? And what they did, this is not a training or learning study. This is just a p looking at their, how the well they perform in over a short period. So they hit 40 trials um, to a forehand, uh, 44 hands to a target box on the on the court and the target box they for the for those they got a score right if you hit it exactly in the target box you got 10 points and then your score went down as the distance from the box based on your shot um they did motion tracking okay and did a bunch of calculations so to again put this into those terminology the essential variable the movement parameter they're trying to control is the shoulder racket distance so they measured this from in different planes the elemental variables, the things that lead to that control of the essential variable, they looked at are angles of the forearm, upper arm, and hand and racket segment. And then the performance variable, performance outcome, what you actually care about, they looked at the accuracy from those point scores. Okay. 
um, what do they find? Okay, so let's break this down into the relationships between those different variables that I talked about. First of all, what was the relationship between the essential variable and performance, right? So the hand, the shoulder distance between your shoulder and racket at the point of impact and whether and the accuracy of your forehand shot. What they found was that for both groups, uh, there was essentially saying there's a, there's an important difference here I'm going to get to later. But if you just look at the size of the bars, right, um, what they did in a lot of these analysis is they grouped uh, sh trials across trials. So obviously, so within trials, people perform poor and good or good and bad, right? So some of their shots were right in the box, some weren't. So across trials, they split um, the trials into high accuracy ones, which are shown in black, ones that were right in box, and low accuracy ones where they missed the target. And what they basically found was that the shoulder racket distance was longer, higher, um, the black bar is when you were more accurate than it was when you were, you, you were less accurate, right? And in terms of biomechanics, this longer distance allows for a greater lever in the swing, okay, if, you, if you're into biomechanics. So importantly, there, there does seem to be a significant relationship between the essential variable okay, of a shoulder racket distance and the performance variable of accuracy. Now let's look, another thing they found if we look at just this distance is they found evidence of online control, right? So if you plot the variation from swing to swing, the standard deviation of this distance, the distance of this um, essential variable, if you plot it as a function of the time from the start of the swing, zero to the end of the swing, 100%, you get Bootsma's classic funnel of variability. Variability is going down as you get closer to the end of the movement, which, as I said before, is can only be achieved by online control, right? A pre-programmed ballistic swing, you cannot have variability go down during the movement, okay? So that's classic online control. Now let's look at the relationship between the elemental variables, the joint angles, and the essential variable, the shoulder racket distance, which we already established is related to performance. What's shown here in this graph are the dist the 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 bars, the top is showing for the full-size equipment, the bottom is the scaled equipment. The bars are showing the contribution of the three different elemental variables, the upper arm angle, the forearm angle, and the shoulder, the rack, hand racket angle to the, the essential variable shoulder racket distance, right? So there's a few different things you can see here. So the regular size group, you can see the black bars are the highest, right? That's upper arm. So the control of the shoulder racket distance for them is mostly done through the upper arm angle, okay? Another way of stating it, they're doing more proximal control. They're controlling the movement by using a joint, the upper arm, that's closer to the center of the body. There's also, as we saw in there, there's less evidence of coupling. Interestingly, and as Tim pointed out in their paper, this is also something else we'll see in novice adults is there seems to be an abrupt change in their control strategy, right? So as you go across those graphs, that's the time during the shot from zero the start to 100 impact. What you can see is there's a, the black bars are high, 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 then suddenly they drop to zero, right? So that suddenly they're gone in that end where I'm pointing with that arrow, which seems like they're suddenly changing to controlling the movement with their, with their hand instead of the, the hand racket instead of the upper arm, which is not going to result in good results good results, right? If you make a sudden change in strategy like that. For the scale group, you can, on the bottom, you can see you get a totally different story, right? They're not using their upper arm hardly at all to control this, this um, essential variable. Instead, they're controlling the, the hand, the shoulder racket distance by using mostly the forearm, the hand racket, okay? So they're using much more distal control, right? They're use, controlling the position of their body using a joint angle that's much further from the center of the body. And as I said, but there's much more evidence of coupling. Okay, so there does seem to be this relationship between the elemental variables and the essential variable. And importantly, it's different depending on what equipment you use, right? So that, that's a, a very interesting finding. There's a couple of other really interesting ones um, that they found. This one is showing the um, what you have is the variability in the angles, right? Um, as a function of the, uh, so the black ellipses are for very, very high accurate performance, right in the center of the target. 
the blue, the red are for sort of accurate. The blue is for terrible shots, right? And one of the really neat findings of this paper is, is if you look at the, the so within these, you have a bunch of shots, so they're not making the same angle every time. There's variability. But if you look at it, you can see the black ellipse for the very accurate, the direction it's pointing is orthogonal to the direction the poor shots are pointing, right? So one's pointing in this with the left graph, it's up to the left and up to the right. If you pay attention and you listen to what I talk about, uh, 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 um, you know, this hopefully comes to mind of what's down in the bottom figure. This is exactly the uncontrolled manifold concept, right? The movement in one direction along the manifold that keeps the performance success but allows for uh, functional variability is good variability. So good variability is in black. Movement away from the manifold, which is called orthogonal variability, is one that going to result in worse performance, and that's the bad variability, right? So nicely, they, they without not really using the uncontrolled manifold analysis, they got the same exact pattern, right? They can see on good trials where you and you can see it on the right graph as well. In good trials, you're varying things in one direction, good variability. On poor, poor, uh, very inaccurate trials, you it's because you're varying the, the variabilities in the other direction. It's bad variability, right? So both high accurate and low accurate trials have variability. Everything has variability. But in one of them, it's good. It's functional. It's evidence of synergy. The other one, it's bad, right? And what they describe in the paper is this is actually um, what this, the main thing you see is that you hit the ball too far from your body, the shoulder racket distance. You missed the sweet spot and it's too big. So I think that's a really, really cool finding. Um, so what did they conclude from this? Right, so the scaled racket control results in more distal control, right? So we're getting uh, the shoulder racket distance achieved in a very different way. And if you think about it, more distal control is going to allow for more accuracy, right? Right, trying to, to, to you know, control a movement with your, your shoulder and your upper arm is always going to be less precise than can trying to control it with your hand, right? Your hand is much more articulation, accuracy, right? They're meant, your, your distal joints are meant for fine control, right? That's why, um, it, so that's a basic idea. So it's not, so the pattern of coordination you see in the scale equipment is it's just better, right? It's a better thing. The other thing I want to point to, and they, they make a nice point of this, is the implications of this for learning. And uh, this is a figure I showed earlier, and I said the, the same results, but there's a subtle difference you can see here in terms of the variability, right? So the black dot, the, the shaded dots are showing the spread, the full range of data, right? And what you can see is, so this is a shoulder racket distance, right? So what you can see for the full size group, the, the variability in shoulder racket distance, okay, is about the same for when they do a really accurate shot and then when they do a very inaccurate shot, right? So if you think about it, the feedback they're going to get so you're going to get feedback based on what the shoulder racket distance is. You're going to get proprioceptive feedback. is going to be the same when, regardless of whether they have a good or bad outcome, right? That's not very good for learning, is it, right? When the, the feedback you get is, is not differentiated based on performance, that's not good for learning. Compare that to the scale group, you see this big difference, right? When they're, they're um, accurate, Right, they get a very small range of shoulder ra racket distances, so they're going to get a much more invariant. They're, when they're performing well, they're going to get kind of very similar feedback. When they're performing poorly, you can see you get this huge range of shoulder racket distances due to the way they're controlling. So when you hit a poor shot, you're likely to get a very different pattern of proprioceptive feedback than when you hit a good shot, which is beneficial for learning. Right when the signals, feedback signals you get differ as a function of performance, that's going to result in better learning in the long run. So that's it for this study. I think another great study by Tim and colleagues. Um, uh, you know, I, I, this is excellent work, and it's super exciting that it's getting published in Nature, like it deserves. So uh, I hope to hope they have more of them up their sleeve because it's really great work. Um, so that's it for today. This is uh, thank you for joining me, and cheers for now.